Thank you. So um, uh, I'm going to be talking about YAPI. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Simon. Um, we did not plan that. It's kind of like uh, we showed up to the, to the uh, event wearing the same dress accidentally. But once we got here, we talked a little bit about the commonalities. Um, but this is a very important presentation. How many people have actually seen it, the TED Talk, or read the book? So a couple people. Um, I would highly encourage everybody to just take 15 minutes, watch it. It's very powerful, um, very influential. Um, and as uh, Joshua mentioned, one of the most, I think it's actually the second most watched uh, TED Talk there is. Um, the concept of the golden circle, I'm going to go through these a little more quickly since you got a little primer from Joshua. But um, he really talks about methods of communication, why, how, what. Generally, we talk from the outside going in. And basically what that is is starting with the clear and moving towards the fuzzy. And that's a very powerful way of communicating. It's a very intuitive way because you, know, you want to connect with people and you want to explain to them something that is accessible to them. Right? And starting with the what is going to be that accessible way. And then you can migrate towards some of the more fuzzy things like why. Um, in the example, you know, Joshua already talked about the iPhone example. I'll kind of go through this real quickly. But um, you know, if you start with an iPhone, it's got email and calendar, um, all kinds of apps. It's got all these functional things that make your life better by managing your work, your life, all kinds of other things. But the real proposition of the iPhone is it's making your life easier. And if you start from the what, as Joshua also mentioned, you're, you're already kind of mired in what the iPhone has to offer. It could be that the iPhone actually no longer um, is making your life easier, in which case you don't care about that what proposition anymore. Um, and as a result, if you start from what makes my life easier and migrate outward, it could be that any of these things makes your life easier, and really what you're looking for is that, that thing that makes your life easier. So the bottom line here is the what is really just a tactical manifestation that answers the why. And so what we need to focus on, and we are at the Business of APIs conference, is why. Why are we doing this? Why are we building APIs? There could be many reasons. Uh, I think many of you are considering these reasons already. Things like developer community, you want to build that community. But the real question underneath that, though, is why? What is the value to your company of building this community? Uh, what do you expect to get out of it? Will they come? There are many questions that will follow from that. Um, New revenue stream, how are you going to generate money from this proposition? Business partnerships, development efficiency internally, and device proliferation, there might be others. Um, but ultimately, these are good things to start with. My view, though, is in my experience, people tend to start with the what, even with those types of propositions. And here's an example of how we can kind of fall into the what proposition inadvertently. Um, how many have seen? The iceberg example before, it's somewhat common, I guess. Um, so the basic idea here is the open API world is, is in essence the part of the iceberg that is highly visible above the waterline. And so that is the area that we all have ex uh, access to, we're aware of. You know, we're aware of the Twitter API and the Netflix and New York Times and whomever else. Um, but what we're not so aware of is the part, the big mass underneath the waterline which is the public, or sorry, the private APIs, um, the ones that we use internally for device proliferation or you know, development efficiency or business partnerships, things like that. Um, so what ends up happening is we're aware of the public APIs. That's what people are doing. That's what people are talking about. And ultimately, that's what people are building. And their manifestations of what they have built are what we see as well. And all of that becomes part of our mindset as we start thinking about what we need to build. And so we're starting right there inherently with a smaller view of what could be done. And we're basically moving forward with, OK, we need an open API or a REST API or some other proposition that is similar to what we see others doing. But in reality, most of what's going on in this space is happening outside of our view. So bringing this back to Simon, uh, what we should be starting with is why API? Disregard what everyone else is doing out there thinking about what is the business proposition? What are the things that we're trying to accomplish with an API uh, as a company? Where's the real value? Really doing the introspection around, if we open this up publicly, are we going to see a major lift in our revenue stream? Or should we focus that energy internally? Um, we really need to do that introspection. 
From there, how will it be used? You know, who are the who are the audiences for this thing? How do we target them? What is the kind of uh, relationship we're trying to establish? And then ultimately, from that, what do we build? So don't think about are we building an open API or is this thing going to be REST? And do we need key management and all that other stuff? Think about the why and then build appropriately accordingly. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about the Netflix lifecycle of the API to demonstrate how the why proposition really impacts those other things downstream. So in 2009, we launched this public API. It was built for a developer community, enabled, um, made, enabled the uh, developers to basically build applications to reach our subscribers. We created incentives by offering bounties to those developers. So for every uh, subscriber that they go, uh, deliver to us, then we would give them a cut. And then the hope here is in addition to trying to reach new subscribers, that we would create a retention mechanism by offering alternate experiences through these developer apps. Um, so hopefully our customers are happier and stay around longer. And one way I think about this is that this mode of operation, the way we launched, is the API as a product. And it's got a developer community for its audience, but we are treating it like a product. And as a result, that product had a very specific manifestation, right? The why is we're trying to reach a developer community to ultimately satisfy our customers. The how is we're gonna build an open API. And the what is a developer portal hosted by Mastery, as it turns out. And uh, REST API, key management, all of manifestations that you would expect. And as we develop that, our mindset was thousand flowers model, which in essence is uh, let's plant the seeds, right? The seeds being uh, the API, give the data out there, and then see what flowers are going to sprout up and hopefully, you know, create magic. So that's how we started. And at that time, 100% of our traffic was coming in through this gateway. So the API was exclusively a public API. And we had a host of apps and, you know, hundreds of thousands of keys issued and whatever else. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, it was growing and doing fairly well. But around the same time, or actually shortly before, we launched a streaming product, um, so maybe a year or so before. And as that started to gain traction, we started introducing devices on top of this API. You know, they would come in uh, on an iterative basis, we'd continue to add to it, until eventually the API looked a little bit more like this, which is basically, Thousand Flowers, still the public API, but in addition to that, we're supporting an increasing number of devices. Um, so the strategy and the why proposition has shifted a little bit. At the core, it's basically the same, but it has shifted. And so now it looks a little bit more like support the existing and possibly grow the developer community. This is in 2010. Um, support partner integration, right? So we're now working with different uh, device manufacturers but we're also, um, oh yeah, and this is to enable the device proliferation. But we're also building our own internal uh, UIs to support um, the streaming experience on different devices. So some of the device interactions at this point were built by us, some through partnerships, and then we had the public developer community. So I would characterize this as still an API product, right? We're continuing with that mindset. Our why proposition is still very much the same use the API to reach new territories, new, um, uh, new customers, um, with private partner and public as our core audiences. And we were still using the same basic REST API to support all three of those. But through time, more and more devices got added, more and more, more and more. We're now over a thousand different device types. Traffic increased tremendously. So in that two year span between 2010 and 2012, our API traffic grew by 70 times and it's continuing to spike up there. And also there's a big shift in who is consuming this API. And so this distribution is actually not entirely accurate. If I made it accurate, you wouldn't see the red. Um, so basically the, the public API consume, uh, consumption is less than 0.1% of the total API traffic. And this, I think, says it all, right? It takes nearly three years of public API requests to equal one day's worth of private API requests, which is about two billion or more than two billion a day. So fast forward to our current mindset, 
our new approach, maximize efficiency of our development processes. Optimize our system so that we can rapidly innovate and get product to customers as quickly as possible. Ensure system stability, reliability, resiliency, so we are now, for Netflix, for better or worse, the single point of failure. Right? If our system goes down, none of you are streaming, and I'm assuming some of you are Netflix customers. And then scaling the system with the business, and you saw that spike, right? going 70 times growth over two years, that is a scaling proposition. Um, so that is core to what we do as well. So this actually has a very different why proposition than what I talked about before. Before it was API as a product. The why is to try and reach new audiences and do all those other things. Um, today, I don't consider it a product anymore. I consider it a tactic. Um, and what I mean by that is the business proposition or the, the thing that we're trying to accomplish with this API is basically enable the business, the overarching business strategy to be better. So we're focusing on our streaming application, what Netflix is trying to do, and then we're implementing a tactic, which happens to be an API, to accomplish that. It doesn't have to be an API, right? There might be a better tactic, and we would pursue that if that arises, but right now, you know, our API is, is basically the approach. So as a tactic, what we're trying to accomplish is supporting the nearly 38 million and growing subscriber base. Um, Support the 33% of the internet traffic during peak hours, which is still blows my mind. Um, continue to support all of the content that we are offering on the service, as well as our originals. And again, the thousand different device types. Um, so I want to talk for a second about the thousand different device types because there's, a, um, there's an interesting dynamic in supporting that many devices. So I'm guessing most, most people in here don't have to worry about the diversity of um, features and capabilities across these devices, but with those uh, differences, the UIs and the implementations look very different. And as a result, that actually puts strain on the API in ways that um, you know, a, a smaller scale operation might not have to worry about. So some of the things that are worth noting are, for example, screen real estate. Um, different screens, you know, a computer or a TV or an iPhone or whatever the device is, um, they have different real estate that is available to you. And that actually does impact the interaction with the API because uh, what you have is a different amount of data that you want to surface on that presentation layer. And that differing amount of data um, changes the interaction model, right? So if I need to fetch a lot of data for a TV screen, you know, a traditional REST API, which, which has a very granular interaction model, has to make many, many calls to that system just to paint a picture. Um, whereas an iPhone might need fewer calls. So those interaction models are actually um, not very optimized because you have previously a REST API that is treating them generically, treating them all the same, but they're very different. And so the, the data you might need across them is different. Similarly, the controller is gonna come into play. So an iPad is a, a very easy example to understand where you pick up the iPad, you're looking at Netflix, and you swipe it across, and you see tons of titles flow through on a very rapid basis. Compare that to, say, the Apple TV, where you have the left, up, or left right, up, down controller, and you're going title by title. And you don't need to necessarily have all of the information for all those titles in advance. So that actually does influence the way that these different devices want to call your system. The iPad, you might need to fetch it all really early in the process. The Apple TV, maybe as you need it. Technical capabilities um, are also a factor. So um, different devices have different hard drive space or different memory constraints or CPU. Um, all of those will influence how much data you can fetch and store in the system versus having to go back and you know, getting it um, on a transactional basis. So all of these things really factor in, you know, these hardware constraints and, and limitations factor into the way that devices call you. And when you're talking about a thousand different types of devices, the diversity is extensive. Um, in addition to that, um, we have many teams and some external teams, mostly internal teams though, who are making requests to modify the API as they're all kind of uh, iterating on their system and trying to improve it and getting product to customer. So as a result of all of that, uh, all of those requests for changes, um, it becomes a bottleneck proposition for the team. 
And so we can't actually scale this way and support all the innovation that, that uh, our product needs because we have to funnel it down, right? We have a limited staff. Um, so what we did, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on how we solved these problems. What I will say though is this REST API, because our why proposition changed so dramatically from when we started to where we are today, we actually got rid of this as the core proposition. Now I should say that the public API is still out there, it's still serving the, the public um, developers, but it is not the focus, and you, know, you saw that, 0.1% of the traffic. So all of our emphasis has been shifted, and therefore, because that why proposition changed, we have modified our API, we've moved away from REST, we focused on a very different implementation, which I'm not gonna go into here, um, but if you are interested, there are other presentations and blog posts detailing that. So, um, in essence, we revisited the why proposition, um, said our emphasis is about the business strategy, how do we support that? Our how is we have a bunch of internal developers primarily who need to access data and have a much more nimble environment. And then the what as a result of that is we built a brand new system that is much more flexible and optimizing for the diversity of those device experiences. So that's where we are today. Where are you? Why are you building an API? That's the question you should walk away with today. That's all I have.